move on right to the next session here. So I'd like to uh, introduce you uh, to a new subject that we have here at the GPC, talking about transportation. Uh, transportation is, of course, a vital mechanism for moving our products around the world. And uh, we're going to move right in uh, to that session. And I'm going to introduce, uh, introduce our two uh, speakers uh, to talk about some of the transportation issues and challenges that we face and look for solutions. The first is Tamur uh, Makhlumi, the Managing Director of LAM Turkey, and also Emery Jamert, uh, the ship broker from Nakas Shipping and Trading Company. And if I could have them come to the podium here, we will begin our transportation session. So if I could ask those of you who uh, would like to uh, meet out in the hallway, please do so. We're going to begin our transportation uh, session right at this moment. So, Senator? Well, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, bring your conversations to the hallway. And we're able to begin the transportation session. So, to me, the floor is, is yours. Thank you very much. I love Lentils. I love Chick Peaks. And I love Pulses. Pulses were my best friends when I adventured through a six month vegetarian experience before and after my first encounter with meditation. It was in India. Incredible India. And it is just fantastic what our Indian friends can do with uh, some lentils and some rice. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Timo Magzume. I am a citizen of the world. I currently live in this beautiful country that I call home, Turkey. I run a group of companies with a presence in nine countries. And we are focused on covering all aspects of the shipping and freight forwarding industry. It is an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to address such an exclusive gathering of professionals. And for this, I would like to thank Mr. Hussein Aslan, as well as all of you at the Global Plus community for sending me this courtesy. I have only attended the conference this afternoon, so if I repeat what other participants have already said in advance, I apologize. Well, we are in Cheshire parallel to the Turkish Aegean coast, at the tip of the Bay of Izmir. We are all presently gathered in a land which we believe to be at the origin of merchant shipping. More than 3,000 years ago, on this very land, Greeks established trading counters. They bought and sold highly valuable commodities, lentils, chickpeas, and beans, among many others. They traded with the Phoenicians using the containers of those days, the amphoras, and they used the container vessels of those days. I would like to call them amphora carriers versus our container carriers of today. So, your professional ancestors, our ancestors, had already drawn the basic principles of international trading more than 3,000 years ago. And besides a few technical innovations, the basics still remain the same. Farmer plants, trader buys, trader relocates commodity, trader sells, and trader makes a profit. We, the transport people, come within this chain of events. We are here because we can help you relocate at a better cost than if you have to do it by yourself. Well, at least we believe so. We are always but not always right. I have been asked to talk to you about the container market and all that relates to it in 15 minutes. 15 minutes is just enough for me to explain how the Greeks and Phoenicians were doing their trade. Talk about how exciting it must have been to trade back 3,000 years ago. But to talk about the global container shipping industry in 15 minutes is a little bit too short. So I will not bore you with complicated graphs and charts. I will not give you smart looking exact numbers. I will not. Because it will make things only a little bit more too complicated. I will take a different approach and summarize in a very short way what we all need to know. Let us start with infrastructure. We 
with over 500 active container, active container ports worldwide, all I can tell you is that it will all get better eventually. As you can see, developing countries' in infrastructure will improve. Some fast, some slow, but eventually containers will continue to move with an improved ease throughout the world market. Container lines will keep on changing terminals and ports based on the forces of supply, demand, and competition. Ports will not define anymore the route. Shippers, receivers, and container lines will define how the game is played. Which port gets business and which port doesn't. Let us come to the main topic, which I believe all of you are actually interested to hear about. What is going to happen with the world container freight market? It must be great. Load the 20 foot container from India to France for $250. Turkey to China, $50. $50, that's $2 per ton. So, what will happen to the global container shipping rates? The, the answer is actually very simple. The answer is, I don't know. Seriously, this is the answer. I really don't know. And if anyone among you knows, although most of the people are already out, but if anyone among you knows, it would be great that they enlighten us. Because let me let you in on the secret. Even the guys at the helm of the container lines, and even the largest container lines, and I know a few people who there, it is tough to say, but look at the anticipation. Even the guys at the helm of the container lines, uh, even they don't know. And it is tough to say that uh, each time they think that the worst has happened, worse happened. And I can tell you that the look on their face when I ask them, so, where are we headed to? It's like this. Th this is also how my face looks when my wife calls me during the meeting and wants me to fix her computer. Blank eyes, feeling of panic, increasing heartbeats, followed by more sounds. So, they just don't know. They cannot even predict the container rates that will be prevailing a week from today. So if they don't know, I certainly, I certainly cannot know. However, this is what I know, and this I know it very well. This will not last. It cannot last. And all of you should build your businesses, taking into account that this will not last. Why it will not last? Bankruptcies, consolidation, and acquisitions. Sadly, some container lines will go bankrupt. This is unfortunate, but it will happen. Others will merge or consolidate into new structures. We are seeing this coming at an increasing speed. China Shipping and Costco is the latest example. A few months ago, the Chinese government ordered both companies to merge and consolidate into a single entity. Hapag Lloyd and United Arab Shipping seems to be the next one online. Talk on the street is that discussions are to merge the entities through share swaps. Acquisitions, CNACGM, just acquired ATL. It is still waiting for approval, but it will happen. And others will soon follow. The numbers are huge. The proportions are even bigger, and the disparities are uh, mind-blowing. But I will come back to that. When I started writing my speech, I wanted to make my point on the fact that containerization has democratized international trading. Today, one can ship 20 tons of chickpeas from any port in India or Russia to any port in the world. Sometimes, and quite often, at a cheaper rate than shipping 10,000 or 20,000 tons in a single bread one vessel. And certainly with much less headache. No brokers, no fixture desk, no port operation, no port captain, no burger, no this, no that. The dream of every trader. 
one person alone can actually negotiate the rates, send the shipping instructions, and close the whole supply for circuit. Soon, you will probably be able to do this, to do this through an application. Today, a small entrepreneur in Pakistan, in Turkey, or in Russia can go out to the farm, buy 20 tons of this or that box, label the bags or the boxes with his own brand, and ship it to anywhere in the world. Here, we can see an example of how easy and flexible this has become. The trader has become a member of the global trading community. He then grows his volumes and increases his shipments. This happens every day, and this happens thanks to containerization. Containerization has truly revolutionized international trading. It has democratized the world of international trading. One of the owners of the largest carrier in the world once told me, he said, eventually, Timur, we have made globalization possible. By we, he was referring to the container mines and to the immense risk they have taken to make this possible. When you think of it, he is very much right. This is, this is how containerization has reached every corner of the world. What you can see, what you can see in this picture, is actually a midstream operation in the Caribbean. It's a micro version of what you can see every day in the Bay of Hong Kong. However, and as I just said it earlier, you have to be very careful about one thing: what you take for granted today, low rates, abundance of space. People sleeping in on your doorstep to send you a China to transfer for two hundred fifty dollars. This could all change one day very quickly, but they could still sleep on your doorstep, but it would be to say you already have 2,500 instead of 250 dollars. Actually, as I just uh, mentioned, it has already started to change. I tell my friends and those of my clients who tend to listen to me not to build their business taking into account the current market rates, because when it does not make sense, but only it currently makes sense, it will eventually end up not making sense again. So morality, of course, take the money when you can, or else someone else will. But be careful on what you build your, ca your castle on. Anticipate, have a, back a backup plan, carefully plan your supply chain. Now, let me show you a little bit how the world container market is structured. I say no charts, but I have my slogans for you. I hope you will like them. Let's start from the bottom end of the list. This is a global top 100 list for uh, container carriers, like for every industry. So let us, let us start from the bottom of the list. 120,000 TUs. This is the total TU capacity of 20 companies that represent the bottom end of the list. This means that their combined TU capacity is 120,000 at any given moment means that it could fill all the ships at any given moment if they load 120,000 containers, 20% of them. Now, let us look at the capacity of those between 60 and 80. 200,000 to use in total. So the guys in the 60 to 80 listing are almost double the guys in the 80 to 100 list. But I guess more interesting when you go to 40 to 50. Double the previous 410,000 CUs. So the logic is that for every step up for a group of 20, the capacity doubles. It's so easy. Easy mathematics. Now let's look at 20 to 40. 1 million 100 CUs. The logic still holds. It's almost double. Just a little bit more. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the top 20. 120,000. The others. We have to increase them in size a little bit so we can actually see where we are today. So, where is the logic here? Technically, I should have enough 2 million CUs, but we have 17 million 400 in size of the 17 times the group below. 17. Ladies and gentlemen, the top 20 global carriers represent 95% of the global container capacity. 
the top 10 carriers represent 13.5 million TDUs. That's over 70% of the global container capacity. Of five carriers, 10 million TDUs for over 50% of the global container capacity. The top three carriers represent 7.5 million TDUs for 40% of the global container capacity. And this is before seeing efficiency of over DPL. And this will even increase a little bit further more. And the party has just started. Now, let's do a small test. Ask yourselves, how many global container carriers can you think of right now? I'll give you 10 seconds. Make a list in your head. Think of it. 10, 15, 20, 50. Right. Can you come in and give us all the names? <laughs> But if you can name the top, I mean, if you can name 20, you already are able to cover 90%, 95% of the global shipping uh, need, and that's quite a lot. Now, let me ask you another question, another test. Now, do the same with how many express courier companies you can think of. Two, three, three. I can do four, nice. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is what will most probably happen with the continent shipping companies. Maybe not two or four, but most probably seven to ten. And you never know, maybe less. And once those seven to ten are healthy and strong, which they will become, it will be a miracle for others to come and start new container services. The capital expenditure is just prohibitive. They own ships, they own ports, they own trucks, they own trains, they own terminals. They own almost the entire supply chain. So, morality of the story and the fundamental message of my address to you today killing the race kills the smaller and weaker container lines. More container lines means more choice. More choice means more flexibility. More flexibility for you means to be able to do what you want, when you want. So, ladies and gentlemen, before asking for that extra 20 or 50 dollar discount, from the container carrier, please think twice. Because technically, if you cannot sell your cargo because of that $20 or $50, dollars, then as I said earlier, you should probably reconsider your trading dynamic. Thank you very much. It was great speaking to you. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Zemak, and I am very glad to be here with the panelists in GPC. Today, I am going to make a very short presentation regarding conventional shipping and today's trade market conditions. What is conventional shipping? How is today's trade market conditions? What are the problems of transportation of grain cargoes, including houses? These are the questions, these are the headlines, which I would like to elaborate with you in my 15 minutes short presentation. Conventional shipping. As you all may know, conventional shipping is mainly used for very bulk and bulk cargoes. It is believed that it started in ancient Egyptian period with very primitive ship sailboats. Of course, today it now goes on with modern dedicated vessels over the world. Let's take a quick look at the difference of bread bulk and bulk cargoes. Of course, there are many other types of cargoes that are used in shipping due to limited time. I can only talk about bread bulk and particularly bulk cargoes. Bulk cargoes, very simply, it is the cargo. Uh, Cargoes, very simply, it is the cargo that is unpacked and carried in a loose form in a ship such as grains, minerals, poles, and so on. Red bulk cargoes, it defines the cargoes that are carried in new types form such as fair tires, bag, strap, and bundled cargoes. Red bulk has been most 
of common form of cargoes for most of the shipping history and thousands fall into this category. Having three final differences of black bulk and bulk cargoes, let's look at basic specifications of black bulk and bulk ships, which are mainly used for bulk and bag carrying cargoes. Black bulk carrier. Ships that carry bag bulk cargoes are called black bulk vessel or multi purposes or general cargo ships. Black bulk carriers can be as big as up to 30,000 meters big, but generally can be seen on the market between 80 to 20,000 meters big. Most of them are here. Understandable from the name, the ships that carry bulk cargoes are called bulk carrier. These ships are particularly designed for bulk cargoes and mostly not able to ship that bulk or any other type of the cargo. Most of them are airless and shore equipment are used for loading or unloading. Here you can see a small comparison of the bulk carrier. Today's trade market condition. All the experts say that the global financial crisis, which took place September 2008, is a milestone of shipping, at least for this decade, if it hit the industry hard. The shipping industry did not total that, but although policies still hitting, it is unfortunately no longer fast and powerful. Of course, I shall not talk about the reasons, the specific reasons of 2008 financial crisis, but I will try to focus on the side effects over the shipping. Although almost eight years elapsed since the financial crisis of 2008, we do not see any improvement on the bulk and bulk trade market. Safe to say, current trade market is down for all segments. Cape, Ultramax, Panamax, MDMAX, and Postmax. In the past year, Baltic Dry Index hit all time low record and today stands at only 625 points. Meantime, you can see a small definition of Baltic Dry Index. Today's BDI, today's Baltic Dry Index, is even lower than the levels seen after 2008 financial crisis. For example, the index reached the highest level on 20 May of 2008 as 11,793 points. Just a half year later, on 5th December 2008, the index dropped by 94% to 663 points. Today, we are even below this figure. Why BDI, in other words, why trade market cannot climb up again? Due to globalization, there are several reasons, of course. However, one of the primary reasons for dry bulk downturn is the slowdown of Chinese economy. Because China includes global trade rates as the nation which pays the most trade importing or exporting. Although surprisingly a positive increase has been noticed in Chinese exports during March of, two, March of this year, forecasts and experts are still optimistic and expect challenging periods for shipping until end of this year. Other than that, volatility affects some particular regions seasonally and mainly due to port congestions. For example, trade of agricultural products on the east coast of America going up 20 25 percent in the past three months, but during the last two weeks it is going down again. This also proves that the general tendency is downwards despite a few 
among parts observed in some particular regions. Another reason, another reason is high number of vessels on the market. All numbers show clearly that existing fleet put together with the new building orders in the yards are way above the demand. This is due to several factors. First, negative interest in government and available money in the hands of hedge funds, which enter the market as a new players and start a traditional normal aiming results of 4 or 5 percent return a year, that is, owner used, used to aim 10 or 12 percent when ordering a new building ship. Secondly, shipbuilding nations incentives to the owners offering the ships at very low prices. To give you an example, a cake-sized vessel, 180,000 day weight, was changing hands in 2008, $72 million, which is offered now $35 million. All the players are agreed that putting more ships, especially overage, out of the circulation would be positive for trade market. Transportation. In this section, I will try to make a small comparison with the container factor as well. Port congestions. Contrary to container or liquid cargoes, bulk or black bulk cargoes do not have generally a dedicated terminal or a port worldwide basis. Although there are some particular silos or terminals, mostly this kind of stuff are loaded together with all other types of cargoes. For example, on the east coast of America, congestion seasonally reaches up to 15-20 days. Needless to say, all these idle waiting reflects negatively on the freight rates. On the other side, due to cost-effective methods, most of the port managers prefer to give priority to container ships. That means a bulker might have to wait, even though she arrived earlier, a queue for a container vessel completing her operation. Second reason, inefficient fields equipment for cargo handling. From the first sailing date of a container ship, container shipping industry managed to improve itself in terms, of the, in terms of the dedicated terminals and cargo handling gear, where, in contrary, black bulk and bulk trading can be. As said before, although there are some quick terminals or silos, generally, bulk of cargo, handling of black bulk and bulk cargo, especially in some parts of the world, step up slowly. Okay, we have to accept that, unlike the container handling, Loading or unloading of a conventional ship is very labor intensive. Nevertheless, we look forward to improving the cargo handling gears and dedicated ports, terminal, for fast and smooth operations. to put his cargo in a warehouse or a silo located right in the port area rather than transporting or s and storing it in a warehouse somewhere else out of the port area. This intermediate tracking not only reduces the turnaround of the load loading or discharge rate, but also puts some pennies, puts some additional cost on the total budget. If we intend to talk about Turkish ports, most of them are quite incapable of having charge crew facilities. While concluding my, my presentation, I would like to look 
of the plate from remarkable air plants. Big trade market of the 2008 financial crisis, despite the high number of vessels present on the market, shipbuilding nations had a low price of it, liquidity, seasonally or port congestions, slow port facilities, inefficient years, equipment for conventional shipping. I would like to thank you all for listening to my short presentation and I hope it gives some brief idea or information about the conventional shipping. Thank you very much. Questions uh, for our shipping panelists? Uh, definitely. Any questions? All right, well, we'd like to thank our panelists very much, Timur and Emre, for uh, coming and giving us this great presentation, actually, on shipping. And uh, we'll move on. So, thank you very much. We have some gifts for you as you leave the stage. Thank you very much. Move into a short coffee break uh, that is uh, sponsored by uh, Digital Group, and uh, we'll get started back again in about 10 minutes. Uh, bring everybody back in. We have a, uh, a global P outlook that's going to be uh, uh, moderated by Sudhakar Tamar, and please come back for that. It's going to be a debate and auction, uh, so please come back for that in about 10 minutes.